He's the voice of Fenway Park, serving as a public, a public an address announcer for the Red Sox Day Games. And his television commentaries have won seven New England Emmy Awards. He's a nationally known speaker, and he's a member of the Massachusetts Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick Flavin. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi. How, you doing, how about those Red Sox oh, this year? Yeah. <laughs> Not only uh, do they have the best uh, record in baseball, but they play in the most historic park in baseball. Not just in baseball, but in all sports. It's the most historic park, uh, sports venue in the entire Western Hemisphere. Of all sports? Of all sports. Of all sports. Really? Of all sports, yes. Now, I can't say the same for Europe because it's, it's a little younger than the Colosseum in Rome, but uh, <laughs> other than that, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty good. But when you, when you think of all the, uh, the great players that have played there and the great uh, historic moments that have taken place there, uh, this is a little poem uh, in tribute to the <laughs> ballpark. More than a hundred years she stood there, her cheering seen our tears through all the good times and the bad. Fenway perseveres. She's baseball's great crown jewel, a treasure, this is why. Look out there on her field, you see the ghosts of games gone by. There's Babe Ruth standing on the mound, Ted Williams at the plate. Someone's great grandfather just came in through the gate. That's Yaz patrolling in left field and center, Freddie Lynn. Cronin's playing shortstop, but Pesky's coming in. Louis Tiant whirls and spins, and then he lets it go. And there's another leaping catch by Don DiMaggio. Jim Rice lines one off the wall. Malzone comes in to score. Pedroia makes a diving stop. Or is that Bobby Dore? Fisk hits one deep into the night. Will it be foul or fair? It caroms off the foul pole, and the cheers still fill the air. Dewey Evans, rifle arm, just cut a runner down. There's Tony C, still young and strong, the toast of his hometown. Roberts steals another base, pinch running from Malau. There's Lombard, Raddus, Jimmy Fox, and Pedro, and Nomar. Look closely, you can see them all. They come there every day. Fenway was and is their home. It's where her ghosts still play. And in the dugout by first base, there sits the current squad. Someday they will take their place with all the Fenway gods. That's why that place is magic, why she's made such a mark. She's 106 and going strong, and long live Fenway Park. Thank you. Two weeks ago, we celebrated the 100th birthday of Ted Williams. Uh, and uh, I, 17 years ago, got to take the road trip of a lifetime when I drove from Boston to Florida with Dom DiMaggio and Johnny Pesky, and we spent three days visiting with Ted Williams, who at that point was very ill and, in fact, uh, uh, dying. And uh, I had to do something to justify my presence with all these great mythical heroes of my boyhood. And uh, so I had been reciting Casey at the Bat for all my life. So I did a brief rewrite of Casey at the Bat and made it about the, uh, the great Red Sox teams of the post-World War II era, when Dom DiMaggio batted leadoff and Johnny Pesci hit second and the great Ted Williams batted third. And uh, I recited it uh, to them for the first time and uh, that time is seared in my memory. Since then, I've recited it all over the country. I've done it at uh, the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown and with the Boston Pops Orchestra. But the time that is most memorable to me is before an audience of three in uh, Ted Williams' uh, living room. And uh, so if I could subject them to it, I'll <laughs> subject you to it. <laughs> The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Red Sox nine that day. The score stood two to four with but one inning left to play. So when Stevens died at first and Tebbets did the same, a pallor read the features of the patrons of the game. 
A straggling few get up to go, leaving the other rest with the hope that springs eternal within the human breast. But I thought if only Teddy could get a whack at that. They'd put even money now with Teddy at the bat. But Dom preceded Teddy and Pesky was on deck. The first of them was in a slump, the other was a wreck. So on that stricken multitude a death-like silence sat. For there seemed but little chance of Teddy's getting to the bat. But Dom let drive a single to the wonderment of all. And Pesky, of all people, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and they saw what had occurred, there was Johnny safe on second and Dominic on third. <laughs> then from that gladdened multitude went up a joyous yell. It rumbled in the hilltops and rattled it in the dell. It struck upon the hillside and rebounded on the flat. For Teddy, Teddy ball game was advancing to the bat. <laughs> There was ease in Teddy's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Teddy's bearing and a smile on Teddy's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. I'm making that part up. <laughs> <laughs> no stranger in the crowd could doubt twas Teddy at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded as he wiped them on his shirt. Then, when the, grind, when the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Teddy's eye. A sneer curled Teddy's lip. And then the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Teddy stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. Whoop. That ain't my style, said Teddy. Steer, I won, the umpire said. From the benches black with people went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the stormways on the stern and distant shore. <coughs> kill him, kill the umpire, someone shouted on the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him, had not Teddy raised his hand. <laughs> with a smile of Christian charity, great Teddy's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult and bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more, the spheroid flew, but Teddy still ignored it. And the umpire said, strike two, fraud, cried the maddened thousands, and the echo answered, fraud, fraud, fraud. <laughs> but one scored for a look from Teddy, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. And they knew that Teddy wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Teddy's lips. His teeth are clenched with hate. He pounds with cruel vengeance, his bat upon the plate. And now, the pitcher holds the ball. And now, he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Teddy's blow. Oh, somewhere in this land of ours, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light, and somewhere men are laughing, ha, 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 and somewhere children shout, and they're going wild at Fenway Park because Teddy hit one out. <laughs> Thank you. I was uh, in Fenway Park one day uh, last year, a fellow came up to me, he said, you know, he said, I was in the ballpark <laughs> the day that Ted Williams hit a home run in his very last at bat in the major leagues. I said, well, congratulations to you. Uh, that makes you the one millionth person to have made that claim. <laughs> and the official attendance that day was 10,454 which raises a few questions. <laughs> we are there the day of Ted's last blast. We are part of his supporting cast. We are fully grown or just a tyke. We are sitting next to John Updike. <coughs> a million people say they were, but the numbers don't concur. There were just 10,000 in the stands, whooping, cheering, clapping hands. Are you sure you're right to make such claims? Or is your memory playing games? Some on their mother's grave have sworn, even though they weren't yet born. <laughs> A million fans plus you were there. That's more than showed up all that year. Perhaps you're fudging just a bit. In fact, I think you're full of sheer admiration for Ted.
Carl Yastrzemski, he wore number eight. In the field and at bat, my God, he was great. For 23 years, he carried the load. A player like that deserves his own ode. But here is the rub. Yastrzemski won't rhyme with any word I have been able to find. <laughs> I've lain awake nights, I've done the research. I can't find a rhyme, I am left in the lurch. There just is no word to rhyme with Yastrzemski and take that from one who has made the Yatemski. <laughs> you don't have to be shameless to do this stuff. But it, uh, but it helps a whole lot. Uh, here's, here's one to a player of more recent vintage. Uh, Start carving the statue, get the site ready, right on the sidewalk between Yaz and Teddy. <laughs> He's king of clutch hitters, fit him for the crown. Get driving instructions to old Cooperstown. He's our Hall of Famer, he'll get there with ease. The Pope will proclaim him St. David Ortiz. <laughs> to us, he's Big Poppy, we loved it that way. The Big Pops at his bat when he saved the day. Other teams feared him from east to west coast. He launched all those big bombs when it mattered most. On the day that he is installed in the hall, Sox Nation will be there as hands, fans, one and all. And when that hall plaque is put into his reach, we pray that he'll launch no F-bombs in his speech. <laughs> <laughs> I bring you sad news, in fact, even dire. Nobody loves a baseball umpire. Such universal lack of affection has to lead to a sense of rejection. Neither team trusts him. He makes their skin crawl. One side will be mad, whatever is called. If it's against you, the ball is a crook. If you agree, he's just a poor schnook. <laughs> he's a figure of scorn, someone we all shun. But the poor devil is some mother's son. So remember before he screws up the next pitch that every umpire is a son of a person who probably isn't too crazy. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is about baseball that's truly a blessing. It's a barrel of fun if you like second guessing. You can sit in the stands or at home in a chair, manager bashing, lambasting a player. You can pick apart lineups, critique every switch, send up a pinch hitter, <coughs> don't let that bum pitch. Hold up that runner, send him in to score. That guy took start three, he just swung at ball four. Get rid of that turkey, we need a new bat. Please tell me why we can't get guys like that. The umpire is blind, he just called that a strike. Ketchup on hot dogs, now that I don't like. <laughs> no one pays attention, but nevertheless, there's nothing in baseball and you can't second guess. But I'm telling you this, and I'll say it out flat, it's the best game of all, now second guess that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I have great fun uh, uh, doing these things. Yeah, I first started uh, writing these little poems, not, not about baseball uh, so much, but back in, in the day when I was uh, an undergraduate at Stonehill College down the street here. Uh, and it was a different school back, uh, back then. They were, in my graduating class, 67 people in the, in the whole class. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a different world down there uh, now. Uh, now we're all the campuses, beautiful campus. Uh, uh, that was all just open fields. I, I was very fortunate uh, in that I, I started to make a lot of uh, charity appearances. Uh, uh, I, I didn't know Kurt uh, all that well uh, in his, uh, in fact, I didn't know him at all in his heyday when he was doing the uh, Red Sox games. I didn't know Ted Williams at all back then, um, but I was blessed uh, that I got, to know them, I, got to know, I got to know them all very well. My great hero growing up was Dominic DiMaggio. Mm -hmm. I had to get glasses in the third grade, and back in the uh, late 40s, um, that was a curse, you know, for, for, for kids. Uh, uh, they'd call you four eyes and everything else, and uh, um, uh, they figure you were a sissy, and uh, Dom DiMaggio, back in those days, was the only player in the American League, the only position player in the American League, who
who wore glasses. And he was more than just pretty good. The all-star outfield in those years after World War II was always, of course, Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio. And more often than not, the third starting outfielder was Don DiMaggio. He set records on defense that still stand today. Um, so he was, he was, I think, the most underrated great player of, of my day. And um, beyond that, uh, I got to know him uh, uh, very well uh, uh, after that. And uh, it was a great blessing to my life. He was a, a great hero when I was a kid. And uh, as a grown adult, he was a terrific role model. He was very successful in business, had a wonderful family, had children who loved him, uh, grandkids who idolized him. Uh, he, uh, he, he lived a very, very successful life. It's interesting, the difference between uh, Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio was, it's my reaction that Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio both understood that Don had a more, much more full life than they did. Uh, they both had trouble keeping uh, healthy relationships with females. Uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they, had, they had real shortcomings. And the difference is that Ted Williams honored him for it. And his brother Joe resented him for it. Uh, Joe was a strange cat. If someone asked me when I was a kid, who's going to be the crazy, unhappy old man? I'd say Ted Williams, because he was crazy and unhappy when he was playing. <laughs> uh, but as, as time went on and he aged and mellowed out, uh, he became uh, aware of the affection that people had for him and started to return that affection and, uh, and uh, had a happy... Uh, uh, last few years of his life, whereas Joe DiMaggio became more eccentric and more suspicious of uh, uh, people and uh, uh, died a, an unhappy uh, man, and he, he should have been the happiest guy in America. This is a guy who was a high school dropout, Joe DiMaggio, uh, and he's going nowhere in life. Uh, and uh, Vince DiMaggio, his older brother, was playing for the San Francisco Seals, who had uh, some injuries in their, in their lineup late in the season. They needed another outfielder. So Vince convinced them to try out Joe, who was doing nothing. He was hanging around street corners at that point. And he was so gifted that within a year, they had given him the keys to the city in San Francisco. Within another year, he was uh, uh, in New York, and not only the toast of the town, but the toast of the whole country. Um, and uh, got treated uh, as, as much as Ted Williams was at war with the media here in Boston, the uh, media in New York protected Joe DiMaggio. You never read anything bad about him. Uh, and a matter of fact, it was, uh, wasn't until after he died that, uh, that he started to get bad press. My all-time favorite team for the Red Sox. Starting from pitcher, I say Pedro Martinez was the best pitcher I ever saw. Uh, I never saw Sandy Koufax, but Pedro Martinez was terrific. In, in his day, around the uh, turn of the millennium, you remember that? Oh, it was like appointment television. You, know, you had to get to the TV to watch when, uh, when Pedro was pitching because something was going to happen every night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Catcher, Carlton Fisk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. First base. That's a pretty good one. First base, I would say... Um, Dick Stewart. <laughs> no, well, Dropo. <laughs> Stone Stone Dropo had a good year. Dropo yeah. had a great year in 1950. Uh, I would say that my favorite first baseman was someone who's not known as a first baseman. And that's Jastrzemski. Yeah. He played first base. Oh late in, in his career, when Jim Rice came up, they put Yastrzemski at uh, first base and uh, designated hitter part of the time. 
when Cecil Cooper was uh, in there and George Scott. But I would say Yastrzemski was a terrific first baseman, as he was a terrific left fielder. Um, second base, Bobby Doyle. And I love Pedroia. And I, and I fear, I fear that he might be all through. Uh, guys who play like him, who give up their body, who dive for everything, when they get old, and he's not really old yet, but they fall off a cliff. They suddenly, it's like Kevin Euclid was a great player until one year he was done. He was all washed up. Uh, and uh, I hope Padrea comes back, but I, I, I fear for him. But, uh, and I love him, but I'd have to say Bobby Doerr. Uh, third base, Wade Boggs. Yeah. Wade Boggs. By far, yeah. You know, he, you know, when we think that the fans are, are, are tough in this town, they can be really tough. They ran him out of town. They ran him out of town, and he had, you know, when he came up, he was a weak fielder, but he made himself into a great fielder. He was a gold glove player uh, um, up until the last couple of years that he played here. He had a higher lifetime batting average than Ted Williams did. Uh, he was, he's very underrated. He, he was in there. Uh, shortstop, Nomar. Would you say Nomar? Anyone going to fight me on that? Left field, well, you can't put your strengths in two places, so, so I'll say uh, uh, Jim Rice in left field. Center field, I got to say Dom DiMaggio. You can make a case for uh, you can make a case for Fred Lynn. Uh, you can make a a case on, on defense for uh, for Jackie Bradley, um, but he doesn't measure up in uh, in offense. Right field. I'd say Mookie Betts. At this point, already he edges out uh, uh, Dwight Evans. And um, that's the team. You did, you did go away when you left out Ted Williams. What about Ted? Oh my God, I said, I said Jim Wright, Ted Williams, Ted Williams, Ted Williams. Oh my God. It's <laughs> 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 a senior moment of my time. We all have. I would have picked Frank Malzahn for third, but yeah, he was a great player. Malzahn was a great player, and the team stuck in those days. He played for lousy teams, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. so he is kind of glossed over a lot of the time. But uh, back in the day when they first started the uh, Golden Glove Award, uh, there was one player at each position covered both leaves, and he was won the the Gold <coughs> Glove for the first two years of its. Uh, of its existence. Uh, then Brooks Robinson came along and uh, he became famous because the Orioles back in those days were in the World Series every year. And so you were seeing uh, Brooks Robinson making uh, those great plays, but Malzahn was a great, great player in his day. How about Jimmy Pearsall? Did you know him? Crazy. He had his problems. <laughs> he, he, he had his problems. He had his problems. Uh, I don't think uh, Pearsall was, well, just, there's no doubt that he was a great fielder, but he was also very good at making routine plays look hard. Uh, so I, I'd pick Freddie Lynn over him. Defensively, I'd pick Jackie Bradley over him. Interestingly, I was in Fenway Park. They had. Uh, a Jimmy Fund charity game. This is in the early 50s, when, uh, maybe 53, 54, between the then New York Giants and the Boston Red Sox. And they had a throwing contest between Jimmy Pearsall and Willie Mays. And Pearsall threw his arm out that night. And um, he, he, his arm was never the same again. It was never the same again. But uh, Willie Mays was something. I, I didn't see him play much, you know, because he was uh, in the other league and the, uh, the Braves were gone by that time. How about Johnny Pesky? He's the only one that had a pole named after him. 
She's the only one that has a poll name. Actually, uh, now, there are they, now two polls named. Uh, do, they, do they paint that poll every year? Oh, yes. So they cover all the, all all the yeah. signatures? One of the uh, one of the great honors of my life was uh, I got to give the eulogy at Johnny's funeral, which was uh, just uh, a couple years ago. Yeah, 2012. He didn't live to see uh, 2013. He was a great player, but uh, I don't think he was in a league with Nomar when Nomar was was really playing well and was the uh, first right-handed hitter to win back-to-back -back batting titles since Joe DiMaggio in the 30s in the American League. Uh, and uh, he was a great player, Mel Zone, but, uh, Mel Zone, but uh, uh, Nomar, and also Johnny. Uh, I could never figure out why, and you guys are old enough to remember, when they get Vern Stevens from St. Louis, they put Stevens in at shortstop and Pesky at third. Why they didn't leave Pesky at shortstop, who had much greater range, and Stevens, who had a great arm over at uh, third base, doesn't uh, doesn't make any sense to me. But that's what they did. They put they put Pesky at third and uh, Junior Stevens at uh, at shortstop. A life of rhyme is a life of great pain. To live such a life one must be insane. To live such a life one must be insane. You spend years and years just wasting your time thinking with orange a word you can rhyme. It's not going to happen. Forget it, I mean. Drop the word orange and use tangerine. <laughs> when the word rhyme is attached to a name, think of the mothers who live with the shame. My son is a rhymer. It causes me grief. Why couldn't he be? A plain common thief. <laughs> when at last you compose a whole page full of verse, then what do you do? That's a great curse. You can't sell it or even give it away. For the hard truth is this. Rhyme doesn't pay. <laughs> Here's a little uh, uh, poem about uh, what a gift baseball uh, is to all our lives. I know it's been a great gift to uh, uh, to my life. Uh, uh, I'll never forget, I'm probably like many of you, uh, when my father first uh, took me into Fenway Park 73 years ago, uh, I can't remember uh, anything about uh, uh, the game, who won the game. I think they were playing uh, Detroit that day, but I, do, I have no memory of the game itself. But what I can remember is holding my father's hand, we turned in from the street, and all of a sudden, I thought we were in a dungeon. You know that uh -huh. area under under uh, the stands, yeah. how dark it is? And it used to be much darker in the old days than it is uh, now. It's uh, it's uh, cleaned up a lot now, and it's teeming with people. And I, I couldn't imagine uh, what I had gotten into. And, <laughs> and we went up a ramp, jammed with people, and suddenly, there it was. It's like that scene in... Uh, the Wizard of Oz, you know, when it turns from black and white into color, all of a sudden you see the blue sky and the green grass. Uh, that memory has stuck in my uh, in my head all these years, and I've been to Fenway Park hundreds, if not thousands, of times uh, since then, and uh, I still get a little tingle uh, uh, every time I go in there. But this is what a uh, what a great gift. Uh, baseball is to our lives.